fellow Singaporeans and residents. I'm speaking to you again to give you an update on the COVID-19 situation. We are now two weeks into the circuit breaker. On the whole, people have coped well. Most of us have played our part, staying at home, complying with the restrictions. We have adjusted to working from home and home-based learning. When outside, we wear masks and keep a safe distance from others. And we've kept to our immediate family units and avoided gatherings with extended family and friends. The number of new cases in the local community has levelled off to below 30 new cases daily. This is the result of the circuit breaker and all of us working together. But as you know, our total case numbers have risen sharply since the last time I spoke to you, just 10 days ago. Today alone, we have over 1,100 new cases. Almost all were detected in our migrant worker dormitories through aggressive testing. The large number of cases at the dorms is a serious problem. To assess the extent of the spread, we have tested aggressively. Not only those who reported sick or showed fever or flu symptoms, but also those who were well and asymptomatic, not showing any symptoms at all. Almost all the migrant workers infected have at most only mild symptoms. This is not surprising as they are generally young and thus much less likely to become seriously ill because of COVID-19. Our doctors, nurses and healthcare personnel are working hard, charging them early and taking good care of them. It is early days yet, but thankfully, so far, none of the new cases of migrant workers have needed supplemental oxygen or intensive care. We had one earlier case of a Bangladeshi worker who was in the ICU for two months. This was case number 42. We never gave up on him. Last week, his condition stabilized. He was transferred out of the ICU to a general ward. It will still take him some time to fully recover. With some luck, he should be able to see his newborn son soon. We hope that the situation in the dorms will remain this way, most of the cases being mild and very few needing oxygen or intensive care. All the major dorms are supported by dedicated teams of doctors and nurses. To protect the health of our migrant workers, we will step up the medical resources in the dorms. We will deploy more medical personnel to make sure that anyone with fever or flu symptoms receives appropriate and timely medical treatment. We will house the mild cases either on-site in a separate facility within the dorm or in community care facilities elsewhere. And we will make sure that those who need more active treatment receive immediate attention and can be sent promptly to the hospital to help them recover. We will also pay special attention to the older workers who are more vulnerable. We are preemptively moving them to a separate dorm where they can be monitored more closely. To our migrant workers, let me emphasize again. We will care for you just like we care for Singaporeans. We thank you for your cooperation during this difficult period. We will look after your health, your welfare and your livelihood. We will work with your employers to make sure that you get paid and that you can send money home. And we will help you stay in touch with friends and family. 
Ramadan begins in a few days' time. We will make sure that arrangements are made for our Muslim workers. When Idul Fitri comes next month, we will celebrate with our Muslim friends, just as we celebrated the Indian New Year with our Indian friends last week. This is our duty and responsibility to you and to your families. Apart from the workers living in dorms, we are monitoring two other groups of migrant workers closely. First, workers who live in shop houses, private housing or HDB flats. And second, workers in essential services. This group is still working during the circuit breaker, helping to keep Singapore going. Some are cleaning the HDB blocks or hawker centres. Others are maintaining key infrastructure, like our broadband networks. If these workers move in and out of dorms, they become potential channels for cross-inspection in both directions. Hence, we are housing these essential workers separately. We are also testing them to make sure that they are healthy and to pick up any infections early. So far, the clusters in the dorms have remained largely contained and have not spread to the wider community. We will do our utmost to keep it this way. In the wider community, the circuit breaker is starting to have an effect. The number of community cases has fallen in recent days. This is a result of all of us coming together, making sacrifices and adhering to the circuit breaker rules. But we cannot afford to be complacent. We must press on to bring down daily infections more sharply to a single digit or even zero and to reduce the number of unlinked cases those cases where we do not know how they got infected or from whom. Because unfortunately that number of unlinked cases has not come down. And this suggests that there is a larger hidden reservoir of COVID-19 cases in the community. And this reservoir is the source of these unlinked cases which we have not detected. I discussed this with a multi-ministry task force on the next steps to take. We want to bring down the community numbers decisively. We also want to make sure that if any leakage occurs from the dorms to the wider community, we can detect it and contain it early and prevent new clusters from forming and bursting out of control. To achieve these two objectives, we must all hunker down and press on with our tight circuit breaker measures. We have called on all Singaporeans to stay home, go out only for essential needs, like buying food or groceries. Otherwise, please stay at home. If you do need to go out, then go by yourself, not as a group or as a family. Even when exercising outside, do so only by yourself and only in your own neighbourhood. Remember, it's not just about adhering to the letter of the law. The spirit of the guidelines is to reduce movement to a minimum and to avoid being out and about in the community. This is the way to protect yourself, your family, and everyone else. So I hope everyone can cooperate and do your part. Some hotspots, like some popular wet markets, are still a problem. Large groups of people continue to gather at these places, making it hard to practice safe distancing. These places will impose entry restrictions to thin out the crowds even more. You can do your part too. 
Do your marketing on weekdays rather than weekends. And don't bring your whole family with you for grocery shopping. When you run errands, go out alone, get what you need, and return home straight away. We will also close more workplaces so that only the most essential services will remain open. This will reduce further the number of workers keeping essential services going and minimize the risks of transmission among the workers. It will mean some degradation of services. For example, less frequent grass cutting in our HDB estates. But I hope we all understand why this has to be done. We will implement these tighter measures until the 4th of May. But we will not be able to completely lift the restrictions after that and go back to business as usual. We will therefore extend the circuit breaker for four more weeks beyond the 4th of May, in other words, until the 1st of June. Then, provided we have brought the community numbers down, we can make further adjustments and consider easing some measures. This way, we can be more assured that we've made definite progress and consolidated our position. Many will be disappointed by the extension of the circuit breaker, especially our businesses and workers who are hurting greatly. But I hope you understand that this short-term pain is to stamp out the virus protect the health and safety of our loved ones and allow us to revive our economy. The government will continue to help our businesses and workers cope during the extended circuit breaker period. We will provide the same level of support to workers and businesses as we are doing now. The ministers will hold a press conference immediately after this to explain the details. Saudara saudari sekalian, sudah masuk dua minggu kita menjalani langkah pemutus rantaian jangkitan COVID-19. Secara amnya, warga Singapura telah berjaya menyesuaikan diri sejauh ini. Sebahagian besar duduk di rumah dan mematuhi peraturan dengan bekerja dan belajar dari rumah dan tidak lagi menyertai keramaian dengan sanak saudara dan teman-teman. Juga memakai pelitup apabila keluar rumah. Saya tahu ini semua sukar, tetapi terdapat tanda-tanda yang menunjukkan bahawa kita telah mencatat kemajuan. Di kalangan penduduk Singapura amnya, jumlah kes merosot ke paras kurang 30 kes sehari. Namun, jumlah kes baru yang melibatkan pekerja asing di dormitori terus meningkat dengan tinggi. Ini adalah satu masalah yang serius. Kami telah melancarkan usaha besar-besarkan, besar-besaran untuk membendung situasi di sana. Mujur Hampir semua yang dijangkiti menunjukkan tanda-tanda jangkitan yang ringan. Kami akan melipat gandakan usaha untuk membantu pekerja asing. Ini termasuk menubuhkan lebih banyak pusat perubatan dan mengerahkan lebih ramai doktor dan pegawai kesihatan untuk menjaga mereka. Kami harus menjaga pekerja asing seperti mana kami menjaga warga Singapura. Kami akan menjaga kesihatan dan mata pencarian mereka. Ini adalah tanggungjawab dan kewajipan kami kepada pekerja asing dan keluarga mereka. Di kalangan penduduk yang lebih luas, yang membimbangkan ialah ada banyak kes-kes yang sumbernya tidak diketahui. Ini bermakna ada jumlah kes yang besar dalam kalangan penduduk yang belum dikesan 
dan merupakan sumber kes-kes yang tidak berkait. Saya telah berbincang dengan Menteri-Menteri tentang strategi selanjutnya. Kami sepakat untuk menurunkan jumlah kes dengan tegas supaya kami dapat melonggarkan langkah-langkah pemutus rantaian jangkitan dengan secepat mungkin. Kami juga mahu memastikan bahawa sebarang penularan jangkitan di luar kelompok pekerja asing boleh segera dikesan dan dikawal supaya tidak menular menjadi kelompok baru. Demi mencapai dua matlamat ini, kami perlu memperketatkan langkah-langkah pemutus rantaian jangkitan. Ini akan dilakukan sehingga 4 hari bulan Mei. Ayo, kita kuatkan azam sepanjang dua minggu ini supaya memutuskan rantaian jangkitan COVID-19. Jika semua berjalan lancar, kami boleh melonggarkan langkah-langkah ini kemudian. Bagaimanapun, kami tidak boleh menamatkan sepenuhnya pada 4 Mei. Kami terpaksa melanjutkan pemutus rantaian jangkitan 4 minggu lagi sehingga 1 hari bulan Jun. Dengan ini, kita boleh jangkakan kemajuan yang lebih mantap dan baik. Pemerintah akan terus membantu golongan pekerja dan pemilik perniagaan dalam tempoh lanjutan ini. Saya harap anda semua dapat berikan kerjasama penuh anda. Bagi masyarakat Melayu Islam, anda akan menyambut bulan Ramadan minggu ini. Dengan masjid-masjid masih ditutup, Ramadan kali ini tentunya berbeza dari tahun-tahun sudah. Nampaknya, saya tak ada peluang untuk buka puasa bersama anda di masjid. Sayang sekali. Tetapi, saya difahamkan muis, para asatiza dan masyarakat Islam kita penuh semangat untuk pastikan Ramadan tahun ini tidak kurang hebat dan bermakna. Banyak wadah dan bahan-bahan online disediakan untuk membimbing masyarakat Islam menjalankan ibadah puasa, membayar zakat dan juga membuat amal jariah menolong mereka yang memerlukan. Banyak keluarga juga semakin mahir menggunakan teknologi untuk terus berhubungan dengan sanak saudara dan teman-teman. Syabas! Saya sangat menghargai pengorbanan dan daya tahan anda untuk mengharungi masa-masa sukar ini. Saya dan pasukan saya sedang berusaha memastikan setiap penduduk Singapura selamat. Inilah tugas paling penting kami. Kami tidak akan berhenti selagi maklamat ini tercapai. Bersama-sama, kita boleh mengatasi wabak ini. Terima kasih. Tintian 这是不容易的政府非常关注客工宿舍的疫情
筹集善款和物资给我们的客工朋友，帮助他们度过这个非常时期。另一个我们需要关注的情况是，社区感染病例中还有不少患者与其他病例没有关联，我们不知道他们如何受到感染，或是和谁接触了。也就是说，我们的社区里。可能存在许多还没有被发现或检测出的病例，这令人担忧。因此，我和政府跨部门工作小组进行了讨论：我国接下来应该怎么做？我们只有两个目的：第一是让社区感染病例大幅度减少；第二是。确保客工宿舍疫情受到控制，以及没有扩散到社区。为了达到这些目的，我们做了两个重要的决定。第一，我们将进一步收紧现有的阻断措施，一直到五月四号。我们将继续要求国人留在家里，除非需要处理必要的事情，例如购买食物或必需品，否则，请不要出门。如果不得不出门，请戴口罩。同时，每个家庭在任何时候，最多只能有一个人外出。我们也将加强人流管控措施，限制人潮较多的地方，如一些巴萨的人流量，让人们能够保持安全距离。同时，政府会暂时关闭更多工作场所。以减少员工之间的接触。只有提供最关键、必要服务的商店、超市和工厂等，能够继续营业。工作小组将在接下来的记者会上公布更多详情。我们希望这些新措施有助于大大减少社区内的传染。可是，从目前的疫情来看，我们应该无法在五月四号。达成之前预定的目标，完全解除阻断措施。因此，我们做的第二个决定是将阻断措施实行期延长四个星期，直到六月一号，以保障国人的安全。当然，政府明白这会对企业和员工带来一定的影响。所以之前所公布的援助措施也将延长。我们将竭尽全力与企业和员工一起度过这个难关。我要再次预请国人继续与政府合作，特别是年长人士，你们的抵抗力较弱，其实我们的抵抗力较弱，请别出门，也别到处乱跑，要留在家，才能避免。受到感染。有人说自己生病是自己的事，可是如果你生病了，把病毒传染给别人，那就是大家的事了。所以，请大家不要轻视、轻视这个病毒，认真对待以及遵守所有防疫措施，让我们都负起社会责任。保护自己，也保护家人。Let me conclude in English. You will naturally ask, where does this lead us? How do we exit from the circuit breaker? Nobody knows how long the pandemic will last. Most likely, it will take more than a year before effective treatments and vaccines become available. So we have to take things one step at a time. To exit from the circuit breaker, we need to do three things. First, we must open up incrementally, in small steps, making sure that we are safe each step of the way. This is what New Zealand and Germany are beginning to do. Very cautiously, they believe that they have broken the chain of transmission, but they want to be extra careful. They don't want to open up prematurely after lockdowns, 
only to find COVID-19 coming back and then be forced to lock down a second time. This has happened in Hokkaido. We should try our best to avoid this. Second, we need to scale up testing for COVID-19 substantially so that we can quickly detect any new cases that pop up. This we are progressively doing, not only by procuring test kits and equipment from other countries, but also by developing and manufacturing our own test kits. Third, we will need to make full use of information technology, IT, so that when we discover COVID-19 cases, we can trace much more efficiently where they have been and whom they have been in contact with. We have the Trace Together app and we are currently developing other apps for this purpose. For these apps to work, we will need everyone's cooperation to install and use them like what the South Koreans have done. There will be some privacy concerns, but we will have to weigh these against the benefits of being able to exit from the circuit breaker and stay open safely. I know this has not been an easy time for everyone. We are making progress, but we have not yet succeeded by a long way. The results do show that the circuit breaker is working. Now, we all need to do a little bit more. Make best use of the next two weeks of the Titan circuit breaker and the four weeks of the extension beyond that. I ask for your support and cooperation. I ask for your trust and confidence. Let us go all out to beat the virus and break the chain of transmission. We will overcome this together. Thank you. Good evening. This is a virtual conference and we are seated a distance apart. And that's why we are not wearing masks so that you can hear us better. The COVID-19 pandemic has continued to evolve rapidly. Scientists and doctors are continually discovering new things about the virus, its transmission, treatment, and immunity. The public health response has to adapt. Like many countries around the world, Singapore has implemented strong measures to slow the spread of the virus, including the circuit breaker that we are living under now. But the number of new cases has risen sharply, due largely to clusters in our migrant worker dormitories. PM has just emphasised how we are looking after our migrant workers. There are signs that our measures are working in the wider community, but the numbers, especially unlinked cases, have not come down enough. We are concerned about undetected cases in the community causing further infections. This is why PM has just announced a further tightening of measures for two weeks and an extension of the circuit breaker by four weeks until the 1st of June. The multi-ministry task force will share more details. Kim Yong will update on the overall situation and our strategy to deal with this phase of our fight against COVID-19 and Director of Medical Services Kenneth Mark will cover the medical aspects. Lawrence will give the details on the further tightening of measures and the lengthening of the circuit breaker, and Josephine will provide an update on the situation in our migrant worker dormitories. I'll now hand over the mic to Kim Yong. Thanks, DPM. <clears throat> As of 12 p.m. today, there are an additional 1,111 COVID-19 cases in Singapore, of whom 20 are Singaporeans and permanent residents. We have seen a significant increase in cases in the past two weeks, driven predominantly by aggressive testing in the foreign workers' dormitories. While we are addressing the cases in the dormitories, we are also monitoring closely the number of new cases in the community. The circuit breaker measures appear to have helped. The number of new cases in the community has decreased 
from an average of 39 cases per day in the week before to an average of 29 per day in the past week. That said, the number of uh, cases in the community remains a worry for, for us. What is particularly concerning is that the number of unlinked cases in the community has not fallen, averaging about 20 cases a day. We have also been picking up COVID-19 cases from our surveillance programs. This indicates that there is continued seeding in the community. Many of them undetected because the uh, illnesses are mild, the symptoms are mild, but they are still infectious. We are now at the midpoint of the circuit breaker measures. It is therefore very critical for all of us to put in extra efforts in safe distancing so that we can break the transmission and further reduce the number of cases in the community. We will also extend the circuit breaker period by another four weeks until 1st of June 2020 to give more time for the circuit breaker measures to take effect on the ground and to ensure we stamp out the transmission. Lawrence will give further details on some of these uh, measures. On patient care, our key focus is to ensure patients receive appropriate care. We must pay particular attention to the more vulnerable patients, for example, our seniors, the older workers, and we must also do what we can to avoid fatality at all possible. Patients who are more severely ill will continue to be treated in our acute hospitals. Those who are clinical, clinically well may be cared for at our community care facilities. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all our frontline workers, especially our healthcare workers who have uh, come forward to, uh, 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 to work very hard and to care for our patients. And I also want to thank all our partners who have stepped up and uh, partner us and offer their assistance in many of our initiatives and programs. I want to take this opportunity to also thank fellow Singaporeans for doing their part in practicing safe distancing. We know Singaporeans have been looking forward to resuming their normal activities, but we need to push on for the safety of everyone, especially the more vulnerable in our society. Let us stay the course and overcome this crisis as one people. Now I'll ask DMS to give an update on the medical situation. Thank you very much, Minister. As of the 21st of April 2020, the Ministry of, <coughs> me, the Ministry of Health has confirmed an additional 1,111 cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore. As Minister has said, uh, 20 of them are Singapore residents, uh, Singapore citizens or permanent residents. And uh, we are still confirming the count. At this point in time, provisionally 1,046 uh, uh, work pass holders who are residing in our dormitories. A more detailed breakdown will be provided in the press statement later today. We continue to see a trend where the number of imported cases uh, uh, has come down very significantly. On most days, that has been zero since the 10th of April. Of the uh, confirmed cases that we have, and in total we have 9,125 cases, we have discharged 39 uh, uh, patients today, and 27 uh, patients uh, are in the ICU. We continue to look after them uh, to the best of our abilities. The remaining patients are uh, looked after in a variety of different settings, and that includes uh, those who are in our acute hospitals, those who are nursed and looked after within our community care facilities, as well as in isolation facilities that we have uh, designated and set up within dormitories. We have a small uh, number of uh, uh, patients who are currently within uh, uh, private hospitals and they are recovering while awaiting uh, confirmatory tests uh, before we deem them uh, suitable and fit to return to the community. Efforts remain uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, further support for all our foreign workers in the dormitories. We've set up medical teams and medical posts that provide support for all our 43 purpose-built dormitories. We are also arranging for a system of medical support that would provide 
augmented uh, cover uh, for workers who are also accommodated in other settings, including factory converted dormitories. This has been with the uh, support, strong support of our regional health systems. And I wish to acknowledge also the contributions of volunteers who have stepped forward under our SG Healthcare Core initiative. Many of them have come from a variety of different settings, including from uh, the private sector, and they work hand in hand with our staff in the public healthcare institutions in the front line, supporting the medical, uh, uh, giving medical treatment to uh, factory workers in dormitories. We also have a strong partnership with the Singapore Armed Forces who have stepped forward uh, to um, provide us with invaluable support in many different areas, including contact tracing in uh, the uh, management of quarantine operations, in helping us to establish and set up many of the medical posts that we have, in helping us to establish uh, swab and isolation facilities that support the work of uh, um, the, the dormitory um, uh, medical uh, system, as well as uh, providing strong leadership within the dormitories working very closely under the auspices of the Joint Task Force with the uh, dormitory uh, operators to ensure that there is a proper system in place for isolation uh, and uh, segregation. And we remain committed to make sure that we provide um, the best support we can, uh, treating all our foreign workers and making sure that they receive good care. We will continue to uh, establish more capacity uh, in our community care facilities to accommodate uh, the foreign workers uh, who are infected and who present to us. And we remain committed to making sure that our entire healthcare system can respond flexibly to accommodate uh, the increase in uh, uh, needs on the ground. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. As we all know, we are midway through the circuit breaker. We are already seeing some positive results but we cannot be complacent and this is the time now to continue to hunker down and give this a further push. So first, we call on everyone to do their part to minimize movement. Remember, the virus spreads through people, through our contacts with others and when we go out and touch surfaces and then our hands touch our faces. Yes, we can take precautions like safe distancing and wearing of masks, but the best way to beat the virus is to stay home. So if you need to go out to buy food, to buy groceries, go out alone. Don't turn this into an occasion for a family outing. And if you need to go out to exercise, exercise alone and in your own neighbourhood. Don't travel out to exercise. So we call on everyone to do this because it is the best way to protect yourselves and your family members. Second, we will continue with our efforts to control people movement in popular areas like wet markets and supermarkets. Uh, in these areas, we will impose entry restrictions for example, in certain wet markets, uh, we will only permit entry on alternate days. And we will do this with a system based on your NRIC or your FIN number. Depending on the last digit of that NRIC or FIN number, you will only be permitted entry on odd or even days. So that's one example of a localised entry restriction that we will start with wet markets and we will do this also in other popular areas like supermarkets in order to thin out the crowds and reduce transmission risk in these areas. A third, we will close more workplaces and also tighten the list of essential services that are permitted. I mentioned this last week and we are now ready to make this move. This is important because when we analysed the local infected cases that occurred after the circuit breaker, many of them have been working as part of essential services or have family members who are working because these are the people who are still out and about. We do need our essential workers. We appreciate their contributions, but we have to reduce the numbers who are working. 
And that's why we'll make a move to cut back the workforce who still have to commute daily from the current 20% to 15%. And we will do this by making cuts across all sectors of the economy, but also in businesses that are consumer-facing, including in FMB and other services. So this will mean that all of us may face some degradation of services, or we may not be able to access um, FMB or certain services that we are, have become accustomed to. And I hope everyone understands why we need to, need to make this important move. Uh, so overall, we are seeing results from the circuit breaker, um, but we cannot let up now. We have to make this strong push to decisively break the transmission chain. The measures that we've just announced will be in place till the 4th of May. Beyond that, we will continue with the circuit breaker for another four weeks to 1st of June. Depending on how the situation evolves, we will adjust the measures. And if there are clear improvements in our community transmission numbers, for example, if we see community numbers coming down to single digits, then we can consider gradually easing some of these measures. Uh, we have said from the outset that this is a prolonged fight and we thank all Singaporeans and all residents of Singapore who have risen to the occasion and done their part through this circuit breaker period. Uh, let us all continue to go all out to stamp out the virus and overcome this together. Let me just say a few words in Mandarin. Uh, 我们已经开始看到一些成效我们需要继续努力在家里把劲也自己一个人就好另外我们也进一步减少必要服务的种类但绝对不能松懈下来除了站在前线的医护人员也需要你我的努力我们希望大家都能遵守阻断措施让我们早日打赢这场仗谢谢at uh, the last uh, virtual conference, I had sketched out our overall dormitory landscape as well as the three-pronged strategies and the three key en enablers for us to effectively implement the strategies. One of the key enablers are the forward assurance support teams, FAST teams. FAST teams have been deployed to all 43 purpose-built dormitories and we have further raised another 26 teams to also look after the factory converted dormitories. 
The medical posts have been up and running in all 43 purpose-built dormitories. In addition, we have also assembled mobile medical teams to support the factory converted dormitories. And all in all, about 10,000 essential workers have been transferred out of these dormitories and have been relocated. They are now staying separately. Throughout this period, we have gotten the very strong support of the migrant workers themselves living in the dormitories. They understand the need for these measures and they have cooperated, for which we are very thankful for. Here, I also want to acknowledge the contributions of many non-governmental organisations who have stepped forward to volunteer their services and partner with the Joint Task Force in reaching out to the migrant workers and to support them during this difficult period. One area which has been particularly helpful is providing emotional support through assembling a team of counsellors that are available to discuss with the workers any issues that they might raise. Now, because of the scale of the operations, this remains a very challenging task. However, we will press on, focusing on the workers' well-being. Now I would like to talk about some further measures that we will take in the dormitories. Prime Minister Lee earlier had talked about the situation when workers continue to move in and out of the dormitories. And when they do so, they are potential channels for cross-infections in both directions. We have completed the pull-out of the essential workers and house them separately. And so we will now require all the workers staying in all the dormitories to stop going to work. This was something that we had planned for and now we are going to implement it. Now this new condition applies to workers from all companies, including those that have earlier obtained exemption to operate, but which MTI will now notify to suspend operations for this period. We know that there are going to be some adjustments to be made by the companies, but we seek the cooperation of both the employers and the workers on this new condition. It is a necessary measure to minimise the risk of transmissions. I also want to add that with Ramadan around the corner, the interagency task force has coordinated with caterers and the purpose-built dorm operators to provide timely pre-dawn and breakfast meals. This is very important to our Muslim friends and we want to make sure that they are properly taken care of when Ramadan begins. The task force has also translated Mu'is Ramadan Guide 2020 on religious observances to take into account the safe distancing measures. And this will provide guidance to the dorm operators on how to facilitate Ramadan religious practices. Mu'is has also come in to develop videos for religious guidance tailored to the workers' needs. We are very thankful to Mu'is for this very important partnership. The third part I want to cover is on the stay-home notices for workers in the construction sector. We decided to do this because contract tracing, contact tracing efforts suggest that the transmissions at common construction work sites may have contributed to the increase in the numbers of infected workers. So this is something that we have taken as an added precaution and during the period of the stay-home notice, enforcement officers will conduct regular and random checks. They may make phone calls or send SMS messages to the affected workers and require the workers to respond to these messages or phone calls. We hope that the workers will respond in good time so that we can also check on their well-being, whether they are getting the support that they need, whether it is for food 
or for other items, particularly on healthcare. Now, because of the circuit breaker measures already in place, frankly, we are seeing very good cooperation from the workers that are affected by the stay-home notice as well as their employers. We're very thankful to them for understanding the need to implement this precautionary measure in a very quick fashion and for making the necessary adjustments. I think if we were to be able to follow through the, with this, work stoppages together with the closure of shopping areas, socialising areas, and coupled with the measures taken at the dormitories, we have a real chance of breaking the channels of transmission and a real chance of overcoming this hump in order that we may slowly bring back the recovery measures. That's all I have today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josephine. Now, let me now elaborate on how the government will help our businesses and workers cope with the extended circuit breaker period. We understand that the enhanced measures and circuit breaker extension will have a significant impact on businesses. To support our companies and workers, we will extend key support measures in the solidarity budget into the month of May. I will extend the 75% which subsidy under the Jobs Support Scheme to all sectors for the month of May. I urge our business leaders to do your best to retain your workers and make full use of the various grants for training and other schemes for upgrading corporate capabilities. I will further enhance the Jobs Support Scheme to include certain groups of shareholder directors. These are employees of a company who are also shareholders and directors and who missed out on both the Job Support Scheme and the Self-Employed Income Relief Schemes. I also waive the foreign worker levy due in May and provide employers with another $750 in foreign workers' levy rebates for every foreign worker in employment. Families whose breadwinners have lost their jobs can apply for the COVID-19 support grant from 1st May 2020 and the Temporary Relief Fund. The extension of the solidarity budget will cost $3.8 billion. To conclude, in the months of April and May, this will be a test of our resilience as individuals and as a society. We cannot be certain when the crisis will end. But what is certain? is that we are here for you and we will support you. Our healthcare and essential workers are central to our response to COVID-19. But the rest of us can do our part by staying at home, by encouraging those on the front line, and by helping the vulnerable and those around you. This is the spirit of Singapore together. The coming weeks will be even more critical. I urge everyone to keep up this spirit of unity, resilience and solidarity. As long as we stand with one another, we will emerge from this crisis stronger. Let me now say a few words in Mandarin. Mandarin. <laughs> 我们之前给予企业和员工的援助和拥有公司股权的职员为帮助聘请特工的企业应付人力成本我们将豁免多一个月的外劳税同时继续提供额外的外劳税回扣从二零二零年五月一日起四月国人也可以申请冠状疫情薪金补贴每月获得八百元的
全民居家防疫，考验了国人的毅力和社会的韧性。美国人现在都站在抗疫的前线上，我们要做好本分，不要慌，不出门，不乱传，为病疫尽一份力。这样一来，我们才能同舟共济，保健康，保工作，保企业。谢谢大家。Thank you, panelists. Thank you, panelists. We will now begin with the Q and A. Media agencies, please use the raise hand button if you would like to ask a question. May we have the first question from Timothy from Straits Times? Hi. Thank you, ministers, uh, DPM. Um, I'd like to ask. You know, phone workers are being tested very extensively here, so. Why is this not being done in the community? And would many more cases surface as a result? Do we not have enough tests and reagents in order to do this? Um, and also, you know, given that we are now seeing increasingly tightened movement control measures, possibly even at wet markets, supermarkets, are there any circumstances under which ordinary people, those not under stay-home notice or quarantine, uh, will not be allowed to leave their homes at all, even to buy groceries or food? Um, this is because, you know, every time this is an announcement, we see big numbers of people flocking to the supermarket to panic buy. Sorry, can you repeat the last part of your question? about? Uh, sure. So th this is because every time we see uh, an announcement about new measures, we always see large numbers of people flocking to the supermarket uh -huh. uh, to, to stop up because they're afraid they won't be allowed out. Uh, so could we get some reassurance that, you know, people will be allowed out no matter what? Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. We're allowed to go out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Do you want to take the first question on test? Yeah. We will continue to test, uh, to conduct tests and screening for Singaporeans and for our foreign workers, but we do it in a very strategic way, focusing on the objective of the test. In the dormitory, for example, in the uh, uh, cases where we have a higher level of uh, prevalence, we want to test them in the, in the first instance to give us a better understanding of the general level of prevalence in the dormitory so that we are able to establish the baseline, what is the prevalence level in the dormitories. And if, from our uh, general surveillance, we also have been able to identify dormitories which have higher prevalence and dormitories which have lower prevalence. And some dormitories actually do not have any case at all uh, uh, for the time being. And therefore, our approach, our strategy in dealing with uh, different dormitories of different prevalence levels will also be different. So therefore, it allows us to determine what approach we should take with respect to the different dormitories based on the prevalence levels in these dormitories. And we also use these uh, tests to identify positive patients so that we are able to provide the necessary medical attention for them. Whereas in the community, because every Singaporean is in the community, we have um, uh, millions of Singaporeans, we will not be able to test every one of them. So even in the community, we do targeted uh, testing for those who are continuing to work, for example, we also will test them to make sure that they are not infected while they are going to work. But we, of course, we will not be able to test them every day. And therefore, we do uh, targeted testing as well, especially when they are being brought out, uh, the essential workers, they are being brought out from the dormitories and separately accommodated, like uh, uh, Minister Josephine mentioned just now. We test them to make sure that they are not infected. And we will continue to test them regularly because while they're in the community, there's always a risk for them to be uh, infected. But for the general population, I think the best strategy is really to stay at home. If you are able to stay at home, minimize the contact, minimize exposure in the community, then the risk will be significantly lower uh, to, for getting the uh, infection. And therefore, if your risk is significantly lower, then the testing will not be meaningful or effective. So I think, that therefore, we need to make sure that our testing is always very targeted, very strategic, and serves a specific purpose. And as, at the same time, we are also continuing to ramp up our testing capability and capacity so that we are able to be more effective in uh, 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 detecting cases. And in addition to the uh, general, uh, this uh, COVID-19 testing screening uh, programs, we also have a surveillance program, what we call Sentinel Surveillance, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. These are uh, surveillance programs that we do random testing in the community. The idea is to pick up 
cases that would otherwise have not been detected because they are either mild or they don't see uh, 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 complained about uh, 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 possible COVID-19 and they do not have case histories and therefore, but we still test them and we have been able to pick up a few cases and these also reflect uh, the fact that there is, there are underlying cases they are, com uh, they are transmitting in the community. And that is why we need to put in extra efforts in these uh, circuit breaker measures to make sure that we are able to bring down these uh, communi community cases, particularly those that are unlinked. And this way, we will overall generally reduce the risk of transmit transmission in the community. Can I just um, respond to the question on whether or not people can go out? And just to be very clear, uh, we are mindful that some people do have difficulties being isolated at home and being cooped up at home for long periods. It is genuinely difficult. It can lead to um, social, emotional difficulties, and which can all impact on people's well-being and health. And that's why we do allow people to go out for essential activities. What we are saying is when you go out, go out alone, do, your, do what you need to do, run your errands, buy your food and groceries, and then come back as soon as possible. Minimize movement as far as possible and avoid going out as a family, even if you are living together, right? Because if you go out in groups as a family, you end up with more movement, more likelihood of transmission, more risk. So overall, the best thing to do, go out individually and keep the movement to a minimum. The restrictions that we are putting in place at wet markets and supermarkets, it's not going to be done across the board. In fact, already under the circuit breaker, you do see that many of these places, the crowds have thinned out. Right? So, but there are still a few supermarkets and wet markets which tend to be more popular and these are the ones, particularly at certain times of the week or certain days of the week, they do tend to be more popular and so we do need to pay more attention to these uh, areas and that's why in some of these more popular areas, we will impose the entry restrictions that I mentioned. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from Cheryl from CNA, please? Yes, um, so Mrs. Teo, you earlier mentioned that um, you've seen more cases of transmission at the con uh, construction sites. Is that, could that be the, the source uh, of the surge in numbers at the dorms? Uh, have we been able to, you know, uh, isolate that as a reason for the explosion in the dorms? And um, can, when can we expect uh, a peak in numbers from the dorms? Uh, secondly, also, um, for you, the Cheryl. McDonald's case... Thank you, Cheryl. Now, the epidemiological findings does provide us with some preliminary clues. We are very keen to understand how the transmissions amongst our migrant workers came about because we really do want to stamp out the transmissions and this will be important going forward as well. Now if you recall, from January to the middle of March, the cases of infected migrant workers were few and far between. And then sometime in the middle of March, they started popping up around the same time in some dormitories, not in all dormitories. The contact tracing does suggest that the migrant workers, although they lived in different dormitories, they had common work sites. And if you look at the pattern of their, be, their, their socializing during the rest days, there are certain areas that they frequented. And these were also the same places that they went shopping. So the measures that we are taking at the dormitories today have to be taken together with work stoppages as well as the closure of shopping areas. We think that the areas where the transmissions can occur actually can amplify the effect on each other. Because if you go to work at the same work site, but at the end of the workday, you go back to different dormitories 
and if a transmission had occurred at the work site, then in fact, it wasn't just where the original infected workers were staying, it will be to other dormitories where the transmission had previously not occurred. Now you can extend this to also include the places where our migrant workers are very likely to socialise. It is part of human nature to socialise, and there's nothing wrong with socialising. But every activity that brings people together is also an opportunity for the virus to spread. And that is what we are learning about the virus. It spreads very easily through all kinds of human contact. And whether it is the workplace, or places where we live, or places where we socialise, these are all areas where transmissions can occur, and if we really want to break the chain of transmissions, we've got to intervene at all of these places. Thank you, Minister. Can we have the next question from Stefania from Financial Times, please? Hello, uh, thank you very much. Um, the, I had a bit of a general question uh, about the uh, trend for coronavirus in Singapore. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, an enormous jump uh, just in the last two uh, weeks from about 1,500 now to more than 9,000. Uh, it's a vastly different situation compared to the initial stage of the outbreak uh, here in Singapore. So uh, could the panel um, respond to the question what has gone uh, wrong uh, in the last few weeks? And for example, in the work in the foreign worker dormitories case, which obviously is driving a lot of the numbers at the moment, um, did authorities not start moving out uh, the foreign workers out of the dorms earlier because uh, it would have been hard uh, for uh, you to justify such a large scale operation uh, with potentially very high costs uh, with there being no uh, outbreak in dorms? sort of doing that level of operation before seeing a big jump in numbers? Would it have been difficult essentially to justify doing so uh, because of the high cost of uh, such an undertaking? Yeah, thank you. I think it's important to uh, understand the rise in numbers, uh, particularly coming up from the for, uh, migrant worker dormitories, are not new cases of infections. Uh, as we have uh, highlighted, the teams are in the dormitories testing workers, not just workers who have reported sick or have symptoms, but even workers who are well and with no symptoms. They are already enforcing safe distancing. They are separated from one another, you know, um, not intermingling. But when we go in to do an active sweep, of the dorms, testing them, we are finding that many of them, even without reporting sick, in fact, have been infected with the virus. And that's the reason why with this aggressive testing regime that we are doing to determine the extent of infection in the dormitories, that's why you see high numbers popping up every day, because it's a very aggressive sweep of the workers inside the dorms, even when they are not sick, even when they have no symptoms. What this suggests is that, in fact, the infections have been occurring for some time, starting very early, um, and it has been going on and circulating. Otherwise, you would not have been able to pick up such high numbers. So this is what we are doing now, going into the dormitories. Uh, we have a strategy to test the workers, to separate the ones who are infected from the ones who are healthy and to ensure the well-being of each and every migrant worker in the dormitories and outside the dormitories. We have a strategy for that. That's one strategy, but as I've said before, we are dealing, um, we are tackling the virus on two fronts, the foreign, the migrant worker front, and also the rest of the community, the rest of the general population. And there, if you look at the efforts, as I've said, uh, we are seeing results. We are seeing the numbers of community transmission coming down. And that's why we want to go all out to bring the numbers down further, preferably to single digits. And then 
Uh, we can manage well on both fronts to take care of Singaporeans as well as migrant workers and to tackle the virus situation holistically as a nation. Can I just add a point, if you, uh, excuse me, um, it's not just a question of cost, and I think it's an important point to make. This is not just about cost. If you look at the measures that were taken at the dormitories from the beginning of January, we reached out to the dormitory operators and asked them to raise the hygiene standards. Then we also produced lots and lots of materials to encourage the workers to protect themselves by arming them with knowledge of what to do in the face of this virus outbreak. Then we subsequently also implemented distancing measures within the dormitories, closing some of the non-essential facilities like TV rooms. But if you look at the measures that we are taking today, it has gone well beyond that. We are now asking the workers not to go to work. So from the workers' standpoint, this is a question of livelihood. Now to say that we could have done this much earlier, I think really does not, un does not you know, reflect an understanding of the workers' own concern. It would not have been so easy to tell the workers, please don't go to work because we want to protect you. You have to do this in the context of a circuit breaker where all work mostly have come to a stop. We would have had to ask the workers not to cook for themselves, prepare the meals that they like at the end of the day in order for them not to use the communal kitchens and interact with each other. We would have had to ask the workers, please don't go out on your rest days. Please stay in your rooms. Please don't interact with your friends. So it's not just a question of cost. It is also a question of what is necessary to break the transmission. And it is important for us to recognize this and not frame this really from a cost viewpoint and from the point from, and as a result, conclude that we didn't undertake these measures earlier only because of cost. It is not that at all. It is that to break the transmission, you really need a whole host of other things to happen. Work stoppages, closing shopping areas, preventing people from socialising from one another. It goes well beyond cost. To add to what Josephine has just said, you know, our priority has always been very clear right from the beginning, which is to protect our people in Singapore, whether they are Singaporeans or foreign workers or migrant workers here. And we expect that the measures that we take will affect our businesses, will affect our economy, will have cost. But we are prepared for that. And that is why uh, we had three budget measures. And today I'm just announcing another set of support for our businesses and workers. Also, I started this conference by saying that the COVID-19 pandemic has continued to evolve rapidly, not just in Singapore, but all over the world. And scientists and doctors are continually discovering new things about the, viruses, about the virus. It's more the transmission, it's treatment, and the uh, immunity. So let me ask our Director of Medical Services, uh, Kenneth, to uh, add a few words on this. Uh, indeed, uh, DPM, uh, we've uh, learned a lot more, particularly over the last uh, uh, month or two, in terms of how the virus uh, spreads very easily and very, very fast. While the mode of transmission still remains uh, the same in terms of our understanding, uh, we've come to realize that uh, many individuals who are infected in fact, are very infec uh, infectious, particularly in the first few days after being infected. Uh, and uh, because they're shedding the virus very early at a stage when they are uh, just having minimal symptoms or even uh, asymptomatic, it leads to a, a high risk of uh, spread occurring very fast, particularly in settings where there's a lot of communal activity. People are coming to together. We've seen this in the cluster associated with Safra Jurong, where people are coming together in close proximity for group singing uh, uh, activities. We're seeing this now even in the dormitories, when people are coming together for communal eating, sharing uh, uh, things together, even in the workplace, the workers, in fact, are very close together. So that close proximity, that ac activity, is lending itself to rapid spread of infection, particularly in, in these uh, settings. And it's therefore very important for us to appreciate this and to minimize our contact, particularly when we engage in, in activities that 
that increases that risk of exposure for us. Uh, we've always talked about the need to uh, uh, respect personal hygiene, washing our hands. Now we've also been uh, telling you about practicing safe distancing. We think these are all relevant. But in fact, in order to disrupt this chain of transmission, particularly in the settings where spread can occur so quickly, it's in fact important now for, all, for us also to emphasize not to go out minimizing unnecessary activities. Uh, and even in settings where we are with others, practicing that safe distancing is very, very important, even at home. Thank you, panelists. We now have time for the last two questions. Can we have Aradhana from Reuters to ask her question? Um, thank you, ministers. Uh, I, I'm just looking for some data here. I was wondering if you can tell us what percentage of the confirmed cases in Singapore were asymptomatic when they were tested, and also what percentage of the confirmed cases in the dormitories were asymptomatic when they were tested? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the data uh, at this point in time to be able to give this to you. We hope uh, as more information comes out, we'll be able to convey this uh, to you in the media as well. Part of the reason why uh, that's not easily available is because we're testing people and confirming cases across multiple settings. It takes time for us to bring that uh, level of information together. We're testing across settings where uh, people report uh, to our medical post with symptoms, but yet at the same time, we're also doing some level of active case surveillance, uh, active case finding in some of the other dormitories where um, uh, a number of these other individuals have either no symptoms or mild symptoms. Uh, so once we uh, have that data, we will try to give that to you. Thank you, DMS. Can we have He Ai from Wang Bao to ask your question, please? Um, hi. So um, basically my question is about testing. So what is our capacity for um, in terms of our tests and how many tests have we done for foreign workers and also within the community itself? And just like PMD mentioned about um, us buying from other countries. So why is there a need to do so when we have our own capabilities already? Is it because um, supply is not, is not um, we are not able to produce the test kits fast enough? Thank you. Uh, well, we are uh, continuing to test and we, in fact, have uh, tested uh, a, a lot more than what we used to at the early phase of this uh, particular outbreak. Uh, to give you a sense of the numbers, uh, we actually, uh, just in the foreign worker uh, setting alone, uh, um, we've been testing anything between uh, 1,005 to perhaps about 2,005. The number varies from day to day, in part also because on certain days, we ramp up testing uh, in the dormitories, including active case finding. But in other settings, uh, we in fact emphasize and prioritize testing for workers who continue to be in fact uh, contributing to uh, Singapore through the provision of essential services. And that testing is, is to assure us, uh, not just those of us within the task force, but also the public, that uh, the workers that uh, are continuing to contribute uh, are in fact not infected and they are not uh, at risk of transmitting infection uh, to other people in the community itself. So the number varies. We also test across other settings, as you know, for other people who may have uh, infection or suspect cases in the community. Uh, and therefore, the number sometimes would rise as close to 2,008 or even 3,000 in a day. But the number would vary on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as you know, uh, we have had uh, uh, a number of foreign workers who uh, have uh, had the infection and and already uh, when we talk about the number of foreign worker confirmed cases, I don't have the figure for today, but as of yesterday, there was uh, something in the order of about 5,100, uh, uh, that order of magnitude. So easily you could see that that is a, as a minimum, just in the dormitories alone, that's uh, uh, already the number of tests have been done. But we've done in fact more than that because there are also those that we've tested and tested negative as well. Uh, so the number continues to uh, to, to grow. Let, me, let just me just add the point that uh, Minister Gan earlier mentioned, that uh, we should not just be focusing on the testing. The testing is really part of a more holistic strategy to look at how we can use that to contain the spread of the virus, to treat those who are infected early so that we can reduce the complications from, from that, and to have the sentinel surveillance for us to be able to, uh, as part of this broader prevention strategy, so we should not just be looking at the number, but really the overall approach to dealing with this. Uh, Josephine, you have... Uh... Yes, I just wanted to emphasise that point from the perspective of a migrant worker. Whether or not you test me, what I really want is treatment. I want to be put on the path to recovery. So 
for all the medical support teams that are deployed to the purpose-built dorms and all those that are reaching out to all the migrant workers in the other dormitories. The mission is very clear. We are trying to identify all of the migrant workers who need our support. And whether or not we test them, as long as they present symptoms, what you really want to do is to be able to isolate them and you want to be able to treat them. And I think the emphasis has to be on the isolation and more importantly, the treatment. At the end of the day, for the migrant worker, it is the treatment and going back on the path of recovery, that is what matters most. Uh, can I just clarify that there was a question of uh, why we are still buying more and uh, since we are able to produce ourselves. I think first uh, we want to keep our options open. Uh, we want to be able to uh, also use uh, different models, different test kits, different ways of testing. And uh, the, one of the important considerations we have to bear in mind is that our testing is not just for now. And for the moment, we are focusing on uh, our foreign dom domestic uh, uh, foreign workers in our dormitories, as well as our essential workers. But going forward, we need to think about in the eventuality, in the uh, in, in, uh, in the end, we, when we want to lift up our um, uh, circuit breaker measures, when we want to begin to open our economy, uh, allow workers to go back to work, allow allow life to go back to normal, and as we progress in opening up our circuit breaker measures, we will need to increase our testing capability because we need to make sure that there is no transmission in the community and in order to make sure that there is no transmission in the community, we need to test a lot more. So therefore, uh, one of the reasons why we need to ramp up our testing capability and capacity and options is to prepare for the eventuality that we want to plan for the opening of our circuit breaker measures. So I think it's for different purposes. Thank you, panelists. Now we do have time for one final question from Janice from Business Times, please. Hi, I'd like to ask for more clarity on the move to tighten the list of essential services and cut commuter numbers, by which I mean, will you be removing entire categories of businesses from the list or will it be something like only X percent of supermarket branches can be open? So when can we have these details? Um. MTI will be putting this list out very shortly after this press conference. Essentially, as I said, across all sectors of the economy, we are looking to tighten the workforce who need to go out to work daily. We do not intend to cut back on supermarkets or wet markets. These ought to remain open because they provide essentials for, for Singaporeans and residents. The FMB outlets that are still open, there will be some tightening of that. Uh, not all will remain open, so some will have to close. And for shops and businesses that are consumer-facing, uh, we are likely to also tighten. Some may be suspended, some may be restricted in terms of their operations as well. All right, so that's the general picture, but the specific details, MTI will be putting out an update very soon. Thank you. We have now come to the end of the live virtual press conference. Thank you, ministers and panelists, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's press conference.